investigation into how ride sourcing is being used in Metro Vancouver and the potential extent to which these services can affect the demand for existing modes. So for this presentation, there's kind of two main objectives. The first is just to get an understanding of how exactly ride sourcing is being used in Metro Vancouver, um, for a reason I'll get into a bit later. The entry and use of ride sourcing in Metro Vancouver is somewhat different from other North American cities. And the second objective of this presentation is to try to see how the introduction of shared ride sourcing could affect the demand for existing boats, specifically for non-commuting trips. So first, to give, to give you a little bit of background, uh, for those who are familiar with ride sourcing is sometimes referred to as ride hailing. And this is basically the umbrella term for services like Uber, Lyft, TV, etc., which basically allow you to both request and pay for a ride through your smartphone. Uh, these services were introduced to the market first in about 2009, and in the decades since, they've exploded both in terms of their popularity, their usage, and their prevalence in terms of the number of cities in which they operate. Uh, the reason I'll get into next, um, these services, when they are available and introduced, can produce both benefits for the users, but also negative externalities for the transportation system. And the distinction we make here in this um, project was that there's kind of two broad classes of ride sourcing, exclusive services and shared services. So exclusive services are kind of like your Uber X's, your Lyft Classics, um, services of this nature where you request a ride and it's you, whoever you're traveling with, and the driver in the car, and that's it. And in contrast, shared ride sourcing refers to services like Uber Pool, which I believe is Uber X Share Now, and Lyft Line, or whatever it's called now, where there is an expectation that over the course of your trip, there is the potential for you to have to share the vehicle not only with the driver, but with other also with other customers who are traveling in a similar direction. And in exchange for this potential, uh, TNCs, which are uh, which the short for transportation network companies, um, will offer their customers with discounted fares, often on, in the range of 80 to 60 percent of what you would pay for an exclusive service. So, starting off with the potential benefits, um, ride sourcing, broadly speaking, you know they give the customers access on demand to both the vehicle and the driver. And so this can help increase the mobility and accessibility of their users, particularly those who don't have access to a private vehicle. And so this can allow them to travel to more places, uh, travel further, and travel at times where they may not have been able to travel otherwise if they relied on active modes or public transit. And so because of this, there is the potential for the introduction and adoption of ride sourcing to influence activity travel behavior, which again, you know, refers to how you travel, how often you travel, where you travel, when you travel, things like that. And also, uh, similar to the role that taxis were playing before ride sourcing was introduced, um, the availability of, availability of ride sourcing can allow customers to pay for um, vehicles, access to a vehicle one trip at a time, which can be particularly impactful for people from low-income households because instead of paying for the you know, higher fixed costs of car ownership, you can essentially pay for access to travel by a vehicle when you need to. However, there's also a few negative externalities associated with ride sourcing. In particular, the introduction of a new mode, once it becomes prevalent, can affect the demand for existing modes. And in particular, there is this potential that it can affect the demand for public transit, walking, and bicycling, you know, modes that are more environmentally friendly. Um, there's also evidence that the availability of ride sourcing can induce additional travel demand, because again, especially for people who maybe could not travel to certain places or at certain times otherwise, the availability of ride sourcing now allows you to do so. And pretty consistently, in studies that use data from cities predominantly in China and the US and now Canada, um, there is evidence that the introduction of ride sourcing to varying extents influences um, or induces additional travel demand. And as a result of this, um, you know, both in terms of in, uh, adding additional travel demand by vehicles and also attracting demand for more sustainable modes, there is the potential to increase vehicle kilometers travel. And as a consequence, there's also the potential to worsen congestion depending on when the trips are made and increase emissions because you are now shifting from travel from modes that are you know either are low emissions or have no emissions to a mode that now predominantly uses you know gasoline powered vehicles and as part of this kind of broad understanding of the potential negative externalities of ride sourcing um, shared ride sourcing at least in early studies has been talked about as a potential means of mitigating some of these negative externalities uh, in particular the ability to increase vehicle occupancies by serving multiple users at the same time using a, a smaller number of vehicles can for one reduce the number of vehicles that are on the road, but they can also reduce deadheading, which essentially occurs when you are you have a driver who has finished serving one passenger and has to drive while their car is empty to pick up the next passenger. And so by ideally making it easier for passengers and drivers to connect to one another, it's been argued that shared ride sourcing has the ability to reduce the time that drivers spend deadheading. But at the same time, because these services are often cheaper than shared uh, exclusive ride sourcing, 
there is a potential that they are, because their prices are closer to what you would have to pay for with public transit, that people will shift from transit and active modes to shared ride sourcing. And so just to give you a, back, a little bit of a background on the study area, so Metro Vancouver is essentially comprised of the city of Vancouver and the surrounding municipalities. Uh, the relatively unique aspect of ride sourcing in Metro Vancouver was that the current legislation that kind of governs the operations of ride sourcing was only introduced in January 2020, which was also just three months before the pandemic in Canada, basically. And at the time, and in part because shared ride sourcing was suspended due to the pandemic, um, shared ride sourcing didn't actually, uh, was not introduced in Metro Vancouver until February 23. And so here's the snow of the study area. We have the city of Vancouver over here. You can see what first we can't. So the city of Vancouver is here. You got Richmond, Burnaby, and then it kind of gets less dense as you go along. And so in a report published in 2021 that kind of looked at the impacts of the pandemic on the economy and in, on the use of shirt and hail um, In May of 2021, oh, this is a bit messy, but essentially, if you look at all the trips that were made using modes that were hailed, so taxis and ride sourcing, there were about one and a half million trips that were made in, in May 2021, and about one million were made using ride sourcing. And so despite the impacts of the pandemic and the relatively late entry of ride sourcing, uh, ride sourcing seems to have overtaken taxi in popularity. And now for every one taxi trip that's made, it seems that there's about two ride sourcing trips made as of May 2021, at least, which is the last uh, date there seems to be information available. So, uh, for this project, uh, we designed a survey called the Survey on the Effects of Ride Sourcing in the Vancouver Region, which we call Server. Uh, Server was essentially a web-based survey that we coded into Tracy, which is a web-based survey platform that we developed uh, internally at U of T. Uh, it was conducted in the spring of 2021, and as part of the recruitment for the survey, we reached out to a market research company and asked them to provide us with a random sample of the panel members who live in the study area to invite them to complete the survey. And as part of this process, we tried to gear the sampling towards a distribution that is similar to that of the populations of the different subregions. And so, although it wasn't a hard quarter, we did try to direct sampling to areas where we were kind of underrepresenting um, certain uh, home locations in the, in the sample. And as part of this process, the market research company provides their panel members with non-monetary compensation once they complete the survey. And from what I understand, it's the equivalent of about $2. It's Differs from company to company, but from what I understand, they offer air miles or they offer some kind of uh, point system that you can read. And so as part of this process, we also tried to develop weight adjustment factors based on the home location and age distribution, or sorry, household size and age distribution of the respondents to try to improve the extent to which the weighted sample was able to replicate the distributions in the census. So as part of the survey, we collected, you know, your basic sociodemographic information, you know, age, gender, education, uh, household attributes, including uh, household size, home location, vehicle ownership. Um, as part of this, we also asked about mobility tool ownership, which included transit pass ownership, uh, access to a private vehicle, and access to a bicycle. Uh, but based on prior studies, that kind of showed that the use of technologies um, influenced uh, ride sourcing use. We also asked them to give us the frequency with which they used uh, certain services, like how often they used their smartphone to navigate, uh, to choose a mode, um, also how often they used uh, car sharing, bike sharing, and how often they used mobile payment uh, technology. We also have some pretty general information about whether they use, they have used ride sourcing in Metro Vancouver and to, if they have, tell us how exactly they've been using it. Uh, as part of this process, we also included uh, two revealed preference or RP questions about a typical commuting trip and their most recent non-commuting trip. And as part of this process, we asked them to provide us with the home location, uh, the origin, destination, departure time, and chosen mode. And that will come back in the model estimation process. We also asked a variety of questions relating to attitudes and perceptions based on prior studies. So it's been shown that the perceived usefulness of ride sourcing it influences adoption. The perceived risk or concerns about safety kind of dissuades adoption. And so we wanted to make sure we captured these factors in our models. And finally, we included a series of state of preference experiments where I'll get into it in the next slide. But essentially, we asked respondents to complete a series of experiments in which we tell them we asked them to choose the mode they preferred from a selection of modes um, for their, in this situation, their non-commuting trip. And so the basic idea is that we told them to choose the mode they would use for the non-commuting trip. Uh, each respondent completed three SP experiments, and I'll get into this next, but each experiment is characterized by a set of alternatives which correspond to the available modes, and they are defined based on a set of attributes that include travel time, travel cost, uh, detour time, things of that nature. And to try to improve the realism of the SPD experiments, we included a set of feasibility criteria, which I'll get into on in the next slide, 
which basically tries to assure that people are not given options that they could not actually choose in real life. And so by doing that, we aim to try to mitigate the uh, shortcomings of state of preference information. And as part of this, this is very technical, but we use the deefficient method in which you try to essentially get the biggest bang for your buck. So because there's a large number of combinations of attributes and levels, you want to try to get a, a certain number of experiments that give you the best chance to get model parameters that are statistically significant, essentially. And so in RSP experiments, we had five different alternatives that were subject to feasibility criteria. And because we conducted the survey in 2022, we wanted to try to mitigate the effects of the pandemic as much as possible. And so for driver self, the driver self mode is a very basic set of criteria where you need to have a license, you need to have access to a vehicle. And we also asked respondents whether they regarded driving as a feasible mode for non-commuting trips in the post-pandemic period, which we defined as the point in time where COVID is no longer a public health uh, threat. And similarly, for driven by, uh, driven by someone you know alternative, um, the person needs to have mentioned that they have access to a vehicle as a passenger. They need to live with another uh, household member who has a driver's license, and they need to regard this mode as feasible. Uh, and for regional transit, um, which kind of, if you're familiar with Vancouver, we define as the SkyTrain network and the West Coast Express. Uh, the origin and destination for the non-commuting trip that was reported by the respondents had to fall in municipalities that are served by the system. And then for walking and biking, it was essentially whether they regard these modes as feasible. So this is what respondents saw in the survey. Uh, this is for the full choice set, so you have uh, driving yourself, being driven. We decided to distinguish between local and regional transit for two reasons. Uh, first, based on the literature, um, ride sourcing has been shown to potentially complement heavy rail and uh, more regional services, but draw demand away from more local services. And so in our design, we told respondents that local transit corresponds to paratransit services and trips made by buses, and regional transit corresponds to trips made by rail. And so we also distinguish between exclusive and shared ride sourcing, despite shared ride sourcing not being available in the study area at the time of the survey, in part so we can understand the potential factors that would influence its use. Um, then we also have traditional taxi, walking, biking. And then based on the specific responses provided by the respondent, um, some of these modes would not be available depending on, for example, if they don't have a driver's license. And so e these experiments, were um, the alternatives were characterized by travel time for each mode, uh, travel costs for all the modes except for being driven in active modes, and then we have specific attributes for public transit. So we have waiting time for both transit, uh, taxis, and ride sourcing. We have the number of other passengers for shared ride sourcing because it's been found to be kind of a deterrent to people wanting to use this mode. And then we have local crowding to try to understand how crowding on public transit might influence the mode choice decisions. And so on, based on this, um, these experiments, we designed them using data from the most recent iteration of the household travel survey, which was conducted in 2017. We try to come up with a hypothetical trip where each person has for a certain distance um, and a certain speed for each mode. We come up with a baseline value and then based on the results of the lit review, we had different levels for each alternative that these um, the values could take. So going into the sample description, it's relatively consistent with the study area. Uh, in our survey, we kind of overrepresented male respondents. We underrepresented respondents who are under the age of 19 in part because the market research panel only includes people aged 18 and over. And then for household income, we're also kind of underrepresenting people from lower and higher income households. Uh, the underrepresentation of people from lower income households is relatively common in web-based surveys, but I think the underrepresentation of people from higher income households might have just been a bit of bad luck on our part. Okay, so uh, next I'll go into kind of just the basic overview of our descriptive analysis into like how ride sourcing is being used in Metro Vancouver. And this is based on how other studies have approached this using data from other cities. And so the first key takeaway is that ride sourcing does tend to be used relatively infrequently. For the most part, about 60% of respondents, or about 40% of respondents use it on a relatively uh, infrequent basis. Um, there are people who use this like this, these services multiple times a week, which is kind of consistent with the literature. And in a lot of early studies too, it's been found that a disproportionately small percentage of users make a disproportionately large share of trips. And so compared to studies that use data from uh, the pre-pandemic period, this is relatively consistent with what you'd see in other studies. Uh, similarly, uh, ride sourcing is predominantly used for social and recreational trips, although there is evidence that people have used ride sourcing to commute to work um, and to commute to school to a lesser extent. Uh, travel to and from airports is also relatively common because if you're traveling with luggage, this is kind of an easier option than having to either park your car or take transit. 
And there's also some evidence that people have used sourcing to breach public transit, which could suggest some complementary, but also um, there is the potential that people are using sourcing instead of transit, which we'll get to next. Time. So uh, the next question in amongst people with ride sourcing experience was how has ride sourcing adoption influenced use of other modes? And the most common response is basically that there's been no impact. But amongst respondents whose use of other modes has been affected by adoption, it's much more likely that they will reduce the use of, in particular, public transit and driving, rather than increase or the use of other modes. Although there is evidence that ride sourcing adoption can lead to increases in transit use and active modes, but it's, as you can see, it's much less common, and which is kind of consistent with what we've seen in the literature, because if you are using, if you've adopted ride sourcing and you're using a new mode, you'll probably use it in place of other modes, or you'll use it to make trips you couldn't make otherwise. And so another, another relatively common question in surveys on ride sourcing use is to ask people to provide us with information about their most recent trips, so that includes the origin, destination, oftentimes it'll include the departure time and the cost. And to try to gain insights into how ride sourcing has affected the use of existing modes, uh, people will often ask um, counterfa a counterfactual question where we're essentially saying, for this trip, if ride sourcing was not available, how would you have made it? And so broadly speaking, uh, public transit, driving, and taxis are the modes that are most commonly um, selected for these types of questions. But the relative frequency with which these options are chosen kind of varies from city to city. In our case, the use of taxi was the most common response, of, uh, followed by driving and public transit. And also, like I mentioned, where most studies have found that the availability of ride sourcing has uh, induced additional travel demand, we see here as well that there's a non-trivial percentage of respondents who indicated that they would not have made their trip if this, these services were not available, which represents you know, new travel demand, not travel demand that has shifted from a different mode. And so this kind of speaks to the negative externalities of these services. Of course, in, this, uh, in addition to attracting demand for public transit, it also has the potential to add additional demand to the network not to mention the effects of deadheading on the on traffic volumes, essentially. And so for the reported trip, we also asked the respondents to tell us what exactly motivated their use of these services. And as you can see, you know, ease of payment, uh, waiting times, it's predominantly driven by you know, convenience and cost considerations for the most part, which is pretty in line with those cities. And so broadly speaking, despite ride sourcing being introduced just prior to the pandemic, uh, the use of these services in Metro Vancouver is pretty consistent with the findings of pre-pandemic studies. So moving on, uh, we also wanted to see how the introduction of shared ride sourcing could have potentially affect the demand for existing modes. And so to do that, we use what's called a joint RP-SP model. And so the idea is that the RP information gives you tr information on choices that were actually made. And so you can be more confident that there is a behavioral underpinning, whereas stated preference information can give you a wider variety of information because you're asking people to make multiple choices. But it comes with the caveat, obviously, of these being hypothetical choices. And so the extent to which your design can reflect the real world conditions can affect the realism and the credibility of your data. And at the same time, there's always the risk that people make choices in the SP experiments that they would not make otherwise because there's no penalty, right? And so by combining these two sets of data together, you can essentially cover for their respective weaknesses. With RPA data, you know, you have informa it's information about observed choices, but there can be uncertainty with what other alternatives a person chose. There can be uncertainty in terms of their actual travel time. There can be uncertainty in terms of um, whether this, uh, especially when you're using one choice made by a respondent, there's always the question of, is there a choice a product of their context? Or if this is a choice that they would make in similar situations in different contexts. And so, in particular, while combining revealed preference and state of preference information, you can actually use it to forecast the demand for new modes that are not available, because of course you can't have RP information for modes that are not yet available on the market. And so, by combining these two models, joint, uh, these two sets of data jointly, you get the ability to compensate for the weaknesses and the potential to essentially forecast the demand for either alternatives that are maybe not as prominent or that are not existent in the market. And so comparing the revealed preference and state of preference choices, the dark blue represents RP, and so driving was much more common in the RP choices than the SP choices, which are shown in light blue. This, to a certain extent, is a good thing because the idea behind state of preference design is that you want to try to capture the information on trade-offs that respondents make between choosing different alternatives, whether that be trade-offs in time or cost or other factors. And so here we also, in the revealed preference questions did not distinguish between local and regional transit, 
and also shed rice version was not available, so it's not included right now. And so we look at the Sankey diagram. For the most part, there is some consistency, particularly with driving, where people who drove for their reported trip will still consistently choose to drive in the SPD. But the other modes, in particular uh, being driven also and active modes, don't display as strong of kind of an inertia where people will continuously choose the mode that they chose in their um, for their reported trip, which is a good thing because we want to try to get more information about the trade-offs for people that people are making in this process. And so before I got into the map, I thought it'd be a little bit easier just to start off with more of a visual explanation of how the model works. And so basically, we have our sample, uh, in which, and I forgot to mention this, the sample is 1,851 respondents, right? And as part of the survey, we asked them about their RP choice, and in our case, it's the mode they use for their reported non-commuting trip. And then we also asked them to make a series of choices in the SP experiments to choose modes. Right? And so traditionally, if you're dealing with just RP data, you would just estimate the model based on this information. But in our case, we want to make use of all the information we have jointly. And so this means that we have a set of utility functions for the RP choices and for the SP choices. And so this will give you essentially an idea of the factors that influence a person's decision to drive or use public transit or bike. Right? And so based on the utility functions, we get choice probabilities which we then put into the likelihood function to estimate the parameters, and which ultimately gives rise to the joint RPSP model. And so the models that we estimated were based on the idea of random utility maximization, where people derive a certain amount of utility or disutility from choosing a certain alternative. And so we have this V component, which is systematic, which we argue can be modeled as a function of observable attributes. And we have this epsilon term, which is the random component of utility, which essentially captures the idea that because utility is a concept that can't be measured directly, um, there is a component that we just can't measure even as a function of observable attributes. And so the systematic component, like I mentioned, can be modeled as a function of explanatory variables, which is x, and beta, which is a set of parameters. And so when you assume that the epsilon terms or the random component of utility it follows the type 1 extreme value distribution and that all the epsilons are ident identically distributed and independent, you get the choice probability of the MNL model. Whereas you have the probability of a person I choosing a certain alternative is a function of the utility they derive from choosing that alternative, and the scale parameter here, which essentially captures the is inversely proportional to the variation and the, the variance of the epsilon terms. And so, in traditional joint RPSP modeling, we normalize this scale parameter in the RP to one, and then estimate the scale parameter of the SP choices directly. And so, it's the same basic idea with. Uh, the SP choices, but in our case, because we use error, the error component mixed logic model, um, we need to include error components as well so that we can capture similarities and correlations between certain alternatives. So it's the same basic idea where we have the utility uh, a person would obtain from choosing a mode in the SP scenarios, which is broken down into the uh, systematic component, the random component, and then this component, this mishmash of uh, letters and symbols here, is basically meant to induce a nesting structure where alternatives that are in the same nest are more similar to one another and are more likely to be substitutes for one another. And so this gamma uh, value here is a, an error component that we estimate directly. The phi component here is a randomly drawn um, fair value that follows the standard normal distribution. And this D value here is a binary indicator variable that basically allows you to assign certain modes to certain nests. And so in this case, because the phi term is uh, a random var variable, we need to use um, integration to be able to get the choice probability. And ultimately, when estimating this model, we need to use maximum simulated likelihood. And in contrast to situations where you're dealing with estimating models based on one choice made by each respondent, we instead have to package them together. And so instead of the probability of each person making their one choice, we have to consider the probability of each person making the set of choices they made. And so that's what we multiply them together on the assumption of independence. And to actually estimate the model, for those of you who are familiar, um, discrete choice models are traditionally estimated using maximum likelihood estimation. And you're essentially trying to get parameters that give you the best chance at replicating the choices that are observed in the data set. And so in our case, for each person I, their contribution to the likelihood function is the package of the choice they made for their reported trip and the package of choices they made for their in the SP experiments together. And then essentially this long equation here is what you put into your um, into your software package to try to get your parameter values. So as part of this, um, we when you're dealing with RP data, you need to find come up with a way to infer the basic level of service attributes for the trip. And not just for the mode the person reported using, but the modes that were available to them. 
And so as part of this, we used Open Trip Planner, and I'll show an example in the next slide, where based on the origin, destination, and uh, departure time that was reported by each respondent, we used the Open Trip Planner API to get estimates of travel times based on uh, if they drove, if they did public transit, and if they used active modes. And we also got estimates of the distance of the trip so that we can calculate the travel cost. Um, like I mentioned, this, these models are traditionally used uh, estimated using maximum likelihood estimation, and so we use that in the software called Gauss, which I've always referred to as kind of a worse MATLAB. And the adjusted row square is 0.36, which is pretty solid for a model of this nature. And so here's an example of how we would infer information from Open Trip Planner. Uh, so we have the origin over here, the destination over here. This is for public transit, so it gives you an itinerary. And in our case, we would, it would give you the, on the next slide, it's a little tough to see, but there's the number of transfers, the travel time, and the distance. Unfortunately, it does not give you estimates of fare, and so to do that, and given that the fare structure in Metro Vancouver is somewhat unique, um, if you use the SkyTrain, it's a zone-based fare, but if you use a bus, it's a flat fare. And so we had to actually take the itinerary that was provided by Open Trip Planner, so in this case it would consist of the route you would use on this blue portion here, and then the route you would use on the green portion. And we had to determine the cost of using public transit um, based on whether or not the trip involved using the rail system. And so the final nesting, we tried a variety of nesting structures for both the RP and the SP choices. In the SP choices, we were able to come up with a hill boats nest, which essentially consists of ride sourcing and uh, taxis. And so the idea here is that these alternatives are relatively similar to one another, and this is supported by the data. Um, and so if you were to, say, use exclusive ride sourcing and you wanted to change your mode, you'd be more likely to change the taxi than to walk, essentially. We tried something similar for the RP choices, but unfortunately we could not find a nesting structure that was accommodated by the data, which actually ended up being a benefit in the, in the next step, which I'll explain afterwards. So here's the final specification of the model. It's a lot to take in. Uh, we have our error components here, which essentially give you an idea of which modes are kind of associated with one another, and they have the added benefit of accounting for the fact that you have people making multiple choices. Um, and I'll skip into the more pertinent results. And so, as you would expect, travel times and costs for insurance to choosing each mode, which is, you know, consistent with economic theory and kind of your standard test for your model. Um, as you would expect, older people were less likely to use exclusive ride sourcing, which makes sense because it's, there's usually a generational divide in the use of health modes, where younger people are more likely to use ride sourcing, whereas older people are more likely to use taxi. Um, people from households earning less than $50,000 annually were also less likely to have used exclusive ride sourcing. Um, and similarly, people who lived in Vancouver were more likely to have used ride sourcing, which is consistent with the literature where People who live in denser areas, who live in urban areas, or who live in areas with um, larger concentrations of activities are more likely to be ride sourcing users. Uh, interestingly, people who own transit passes, and I believe paratransit users as well, were both more likely to choose ride sourcing in the SP experiments, which could, again, potentially suggest complementarity, where for people with transit passes, uh, presumably they use public transit relatively frequently, they could use ride sourcing as a means of making trips where it may be more difficult or not feasible to make these trips by public transit. But there's also the risk that the, if uh, these people shift too many of the trips to transit, they may stop buying passes. And so this is something to keep in mind. Uh, notably, too, in our utility functions, we found that the choice of trip ride sourcing was influenced by travel costs, but not travel time, which is somewhat consistent with the literature in the sense that, for the most part, the decision to use shared ride sourcing is kind of driven by utilitarian considerations related to travel time and cost. You know, anecdotally, there is information or there are stories of people who use shared ride sourcing because it's cheaper and then kind of just roll the dice and hope that no one gets matched up with them. Because the discount is, the fair discount is applied regardless. It does not fluctuate based on whether you are matched with another customer or the number of people you are matched with. And so to a certain extent it makes sense, but also kind of speaks to the concern that the relatively lower costs of shared ride sourcing can influence um, or can attract demand from existing modes. And so, as you would expect as well, the persons of the passengers deterred the use of shared ride sourcing. And so, there's this interesting balance where people obviously like the fact that there's a cash discount, but they really don't want to share their rides. And so, this can kind of limit the extent to which shared ride sourcing is actually able to address the negative externalities of ride sourcing as a whole. Because if people are dissuaded by using these services, then you still have situations where you have drivers serving individual passengers, vehicle occupancy is relatively low, and then you potentially have a dead head. And so um, we have, what we have right now is a model where we have a set of utility functions for the RP choices and for the SP choices. But in order to actually forecast and provide more credible forecasts, quite frankly, we want to use information that's based solely on observed, uh, information on observed choices. And so to do this, we essentially have to 
bring shared ride sourcing from being solely in the SP domain into the RP domain. And this is kind of wonky, so I won't get too deep into the math, but essentially, the, there's this idea in this free choice modeling that only differences in utility matter. And so we essentially transferred shared ride sourcing from the SP domain to the RP domain by basing it on the difference between the utility of the shared ride sourcing and exclusive ride sourcing as the most similar existing alternative. And so to do that, we first calculated the difference in utilities in the SP domain. We transferred the, well, sorry, the next step was then we took, we updated the alternative specific constants, which are meant to try to help your model replicate observed shares of um, the, the observed market shares for each mode. And so we used the weight adjusted sample to try to update the alternative specific constants while keeping the other parameters uh, fixed. We then transferred the utility function from the RP, uh, SP domain to the RP domain based on the ratio of scale parameters. So we multiplied the parameter values of the, uh, the, the values of the parameters in the utility function for shared ride sourcing um, with the ratio of the scale parameter in the SP to the RP, oh, sorry, RP to SP. So that it, the parameters themselves were transferred from the SP domain to the RP domain. And again, it's kind of wonky, but the reason we have to do this is that the parameters, the parameter values are always compounded by the values of the scale parameter. And so you cannot identify each one individually. And so this is essentially accounting for the difference in the scale between the RP choices and the SP choices. And then finally, we calculated the, the alternative specific constant corresponding to shared ride sourcing based on the difference in utility in the RP domain. So that's a lot of that's a lot of uh, words just to say that we did this basically where where we had uh, seven modes now we have eight and so we then took the model that we updated and applied it back to the data set um, that we used to estimate the model to see how the model shares changed um, or could potentially change if shared ride sourcing was introduced and so again here this is similar to the table I showed before these are the model shares of the reported trip and then when we add in shared ride sourcing, obviously it's going to attract demand from other modes. But it, the extent to which it attracts demand from existing modes differs. And so when you look at the percent change, it looks like shared ride sourcing has the biggest impact on public transit, which again is kind of the concern that's been raised, you know, by offering discounted fares, you are essentially bringing the cost of shared ride sourcing closer to that of public transit. Or sorry, this is exclusive ride sourcing, which again makes sense because the, these two services are relatively similar, it's just a different class of service. And then moving on to the more sustainable modes, again, with public transit, bicycle, and walking, you know, this speaks to the concern that um, the relatively lower cost of shared ride sourcing can kind of encourage people to use these modes instead of active modes in public transit. And so to that end, there is the potential that the availability of shared ride sourcing could worsen the impact of uh, ride sourcing as a whole on the demand for more sustainable modes. And while there might be a net benefit in the sense that a greater use of shared ride sourcing can help increase vehicle occupancies. There's also the risk that you're still adding trips made by private vehicles, many of which are powered by gasoline, um, in place of trips made by more sustainable modes. And so just to end with some policy implications, um, these results, while not comprehensive, highlight the potential for shared ride sourcing to attract demand from more sustainable modes. And based on the results from the uh, SP choices, travel costs seems to be a reasonably promising approach to try to mitigate the impacts of shared ride sourcing on more sustainable modes. And that can include things like adding penalties for shorter trips, or adding penalties for trips that are made within the vicinity of um, transit stations, or adding trips, uh, adding penalties for trips that are made in areas that are relatively walkable. But at the same time, if you want to stem the tide of shared ride sourcing potentially tracking demand from more sustainable modes, you need to make the other modes more feasible too. right? And so you need to, you know, improving transit service, improving frequency, improving coverage can help Improving the coverage of best recycling facilities can help to make these modes more attractive and ideally limit the extent to which um, trips made by these modes could be taken away by shared ride sourcing. Although there are some that will just be uh, attracted anyway, it's just based on circumstances. And so there's a few important limitations. Um, for one, we only consider non commuting trips, and so there is the potential that the impacts of shared ride sourcing could differ based on commuting trips. I mean, mode choice as a whole is affected by trip purpose, and so it is possible that shared ride sourcing's impacts on other modes could differ. When you, consider not or when you consider commuting trips. Our sample size is relatively small. Like I mentioned, we had about 1,850 respondents. That's obviously much lower than your traditional household travel survey. And we were not um, as adamant about help making sure that the sample was representative of the study area. And at the same time, respondents, because we used a web-based survey, there is a potential that they could be, on average, more technologically savvy than your average uh, member of the population. And given that technological savvy has been found to influence ride sourcing adoption, 
the, that could limit the extent to which we can generalize the results. And so, finally, the key takeaways are basically that you know, crowdsourcing use, despite these services being introduced relatively late and almost entirely coinciding with the pandemic, the use of the services is pretty consistent with uh, existing studies that were conducted in the pre-pandemic period. Um, the availability of crowdsourcing, like I mentioned, has a huge trial demand, which is a pretty consistent finding. And also, the use of public transit, um, just by virtue of transit pass ownership influencing the choice of ride sourcing, uh, can influence the use of these services. And so while there is a potential for complementarity, there is most likely a much larger potential for competition within these two modes. And based on, you know, the extent to which transit agencies kind of rely on fare box revenues to sustain operations, there is a risk of kind of initiating a so-called death spiral where lower revenues lead to service, which then leads to lower revenues. Okay, well, I'm going to yeah, so that's all I got. Uh, if you're interested in any of my other work, the QR code takes you to my Google Color pitch. Otherwise, uh, happy to answer any questions. It's always like science. <laughs> So we use the de-efficient method in the software called Engine. Essentially, you have to give it a set of prior values, so the priors corresponding to the parameters that you want to include in your experiment, which correspond to these attributes here. And so we tried to find prior values from previous surveys that were on similar topics, and so a lot of these were based on the work we did in the city of Toronto. And then we did a typical kind of, you know, we have certain expectations for what the sign, for example, of waiting time would be. And so in those situations where we couldn't find prior values, we used uh, relatively low uh, values with relatively low magnitudes mm -hmm. and the expected sign. Uh, in our case, we used um, NGINE to design the experiments. We wanted to get, have a set of three experiments. And because NGINE doesn't actually convert, we set the criteria to be just after 20,000 iterations. Mm -hmm. If you can find enough of a you can stop there, because otherwise it won't cover stuff. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question about the SV Yeah. Okay. And then for the second question, um, in our case, we, at least for me philosophically, like I do not use incomplete responses. Mm -hmm. And so the 1850 is fully completed responses. That includes um, us removing information that was not, um, that didn't seem logical, and removing responses from people whose uh, stated address was outside the study area. Because for the most part, the market research companies are pretty good about giving us a certain number of respondents in each subregion. But sometimes they include people who are just outside. So I don't know this region very well, but it's kind of like, if we want to look at the GTA, they might give us some people who live in like London, Ontario. Mm -hmm. So like close but not quite. And so we had to remove those. And so the 1850 is um, is the number of RP responses we get, and because we ask people to complete three SPs, that's three times that. So 55 fish, give or take 55. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Well, In our case, um, so uh, parking costs, I don't think we did. Oh, so we do have a parking cost attribute. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and then travel cost was based on um, the local uh, car insurance agency has like a rough estimate for like if you drive 100,000 or 1,000 kilometers, this is how much it would cost you in a year. So that was based on this and the, the distance of the trip. But we did have a parking cost and it differed based on the trip purpose. And so we figured that for non commuting trips, it was much more likely that you would be in a location where parking was free. So to that end, um, the three levels we used for the parking costs for non-commuting trips was zero, five, and ten dollars, just to kind of have you know, nice round numbers. And because we couldn't get information about how much people were paying for parking, um, but then for the commuting trips, we included um, a, a different set of values just to see how that would affect the choices. But what's the um, for the person that pay the parking cost by her means? Uh, yeah, that was not something we considered. To be honest with you, we just figured. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's a problem in my as well. Yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, we can ask 
Even for uh, travel costs too, with driving in particular, it's it was difficult to approach because on the one hand there is a cost associated with driving where you need to pay for insurance and gas and nothing else, mm -hmm. but you're not necessarily paying out of pocket, and so yeah, yeah. whether that's regarded as the same, it's I guess somewhat similar to your situation because you're paying upfront for a permit and then it's kind of free in a sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, for model uh, for model estimation, uh, why did you use uh, goals or like programming languages such as uh, Python or R? Uh, does it have any kind of uh, uh, advantage in this case, or it's just a matter of preference? To a large extent, it's a matter of preference, but I will say, because Gauss requires you to code your likelihood, you have to basically code everything, and then at the end, you have the likelihood function defined, and you give it to a gradient descent algorithm. So I tell people all the time, like, never, never do things you don't have to, but if you do have to, uh, part of why we use Gauss, and it's partly because Professor Kubi uses it, uh, but also... You're just telling me right now. <laughs> but also, it does give you greater flexibility, because these packages you get in, like, Apollo and Biogen, uh, they are very good and easy to use, but they can be somewhat restrictive in terms of the different types of correlation structures you're allowed to get. And so in this situation in particular, because we wanted to... Let me just go over here. Uh, because we also wanted to update the model, I don't know how feasible that would have been in an existing package given the constraints because we're essentially, we have two sets of utilities and we're transferring one utility function from SP to RP. And so that there's probably a way to do it in all or Biogeo, but in our case, I'm used to Gauss and the extent to which you can control things in Gauss is much greater than these other packages, for better or for worse. Because you can't play the package if it doesn't estimate because you just wrote it wrong, right? Yeah. Question? Yeah, I just have a question. Do you consider the type of region and its effect, like if it's urban, it's urban, downtown, and the effect on this, like, right source thing in the budget? Yeah, so in broad strokes, we kind of use Vancouver as our proxy for a more urban area because compared to the rest of the study area, it's more dense, it's more accessible, it's more walkable. And you kind of see that from the, uh, from the, uh, open street map here where very clearly Vancouver has the largest swath of uh, these gray areas. Okay. And so we considered home location and um, the origin of the trip as in the model. Um, but we didn't distinguish between, for example, like in Vancouver, between like more dense areas versus less dense. It was more just um, our sub-regions in like broad strokes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did you mention you were asking to recruit the local transit and yeah. regional transit, but it does not include the RP? Yeah. Uh, why is that? Uh, mainly because we didn't want to confuse the respondents. And so, in our case, we wanted to reserve that for the SP so we can get more information about the potential trade-offs. But for the RP, we figured it was kind of good enough to use public transit as a whole, so we could, uh, to be able to capture trips where people kind of you know use the bus as like an access mode to the rapid transit system and not have to distinguish between the two. But they are not confused with the SP. Hopefully, we did we get we did get an introductory explanation or like yeah, before the SP. Okay. But it was more I think for simplicity because we didn't want to. We wanted to reserve the more involved choice tasks for like the SP. But like we, it, it would have been more interesting to distinguish between the two, though, I will say. Uh, you mentioned that ride sharing, um, like ride sourcing, got a lot more popular yeah. after the pandemic, like especially more than taxi, like you said twice as much. Yeah. Do you know why that might be? So I don't have any like proof about this, but anecdotally, from what I understand, when ride sourcing companies enter a market, they try really hard to undercut the taxi industry. Mm -hmm. And so for my my best guess would be that because it's still in the early stages of its kind of life cycle in Vancouver, they're probably offering rates that are relatively low to try to attract demand from taxis. And you've seen kind of in Toronto and other places where people talk about Uber being more expensive now. It could be that once you kind of enter the market and you're established, you feel more comfortable charging people more because there's a habit built up. That would be my guess. Otherwise, as someone who's not from Vancouver, I can't really comment on the quality of the taxi service, but anecdotally, from what I understand, there are certain times where the waiting times are, can be quite high for taxis. So that, combined with the potential convenience associated with ride sourcing, in particular, the ability to kind of get an estimate of the waiting time. And I believe taxis have an app as well, but you know, maybe that mystique of like ride sourcing plus the relatively lower cost while they're trying to undercut the taxi industry we might have something to do with it. Do you think it would be worth it for um, the transit agencies with their uh, face with transit to look into adding something similar to uh, like a ride here um, 
for for um, to to buy all this uh, so that they don't have that death spiral. It's tough to say as someone who's not a transit person. Like ideally, the easy argument to make is that you could use maybe this more something akin to like demand responsive transit or ride sharing in places where it's less uh, feasible to operate or it's too costly to operate fixed route transit. And so that at, I think it, it's definitely possible if you want to try to get people to rapid transit stations. And so in certain situations and in certain locations, it might be feasible. But I think the biggest benefit would be if you were to incorporate these services into paratransit, because from what I understand, both, uh, well, at least in Metro Vancouver, it's similar to Toronto, where you need to kind of book a trip a day in advance. And so if you could enter some kind of partnership where maybe there's like a subsidy from the government, you could provide maybe more spontaneous trips or more on-demand services to paratransit users. But, it, but um, the use of, I guess, these partnerships with ride sourcing companies and transit agencies to provide access or ride service in like lower, less dense areas where maybe the land use is not super conducive to fixed route transit hasn't talked about as well. I guess for me, the end game is if you can get autonomous ride sourcing, that's kind of the, the best outcome, right? Because you have relatively lower um, operating costs and potentially more access. But then there's also the emissions aspect as well, depending on what the what, uh, fuel type is used. Thank you, Patrick, for such a great presentation. Yes.